Hey folks, welcome back to another Throat Punch Lunch. Thank you so much for joining us once again. I hope that you're enjoying these episodes as much as it is, uh, as much as we are creating the content for the episodes. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make a, a segment this week, just had too much going on, but I do have no less than 12 other segments lined up for you from varying contributors, uh, the ones that you're used to. Missing a couple, but they've contacted me. They'll be back next time. Uh, so without further ado, let's get down to it, shall we? Most Ameritrash games have a random element in it. And that tool of chance is usually some form of this, a die. This little random number generator has been a source of exuberance and frustration for thousands of years. However, there are some board game mechanics that help you control some of the chaos that comes from rolling this. I want to talk about some of those in this installment a Face Up Center of the Table. Dice have become synonymous with games, including board games, RPGs, miniature games, and craps. In games like Monopoly, Sorry, and Trouble, you roll the dice and basically what you see is what you get. And that's where some of the frustration comes in for me. Personally, I like a little bit more control over the use and outcome of dice. And that's why games that give me a little bit of that control help me become less frustrated when things don't go my way. To be honest, the frustration never fully goes away. Since I have a background in engineering, my brain always starts running through these calculations and numbers and of when is the best time to roll and what do I need to hit and how many dice do I need and even after all of that I may come up with a calculation of like I have an 86% chance to succeed. So I grab up all the dice and I roll them on the table and they just all come up blanks causing me to lose and just throwing me into a fit of rage. Come on Eric Lang, why did you have to make XCOM so hard? There are several game mechanics that let you increase the chances of getting what you want. One of those is a simple re-roll. King of Tokyo is a great example of this. On your turn, you roll six dice and you can re-roll those dice up to two times. So on that first roll, if you don't get what you want, you can re-roll a couple more times, hopefully get what you're looking for. Zombicide has two ways to increase your odds when rolling dice in combat. One is by adding more dice to your roll, which can be done through getting weapons or maybe new skills. But you also can gain new skills that will add a modifier to your roll, which will increase your chances of success. For example, you may need to roll a four or higher to hit. If you get a plus one to that result, then you need a three or higher to hit. So your chances of success go from 50% to 67%. Okay, fine, 66.66% repeating. There are some games that allow you to modify the result after the dice are rolled. For example, in Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition, after you make a skill check, you can spend clue tokens to convert investigation results on the dice to successes. Some games have mechanisms where you don't have to roll the die at all. For example, in Dead of Winter, when you move from location to location, you roll an exposure die. This is a 12-sided die that when you roll it, you could take damage or you could actually die if the bite symbol shows up on the die. However, when you're moving, you could decide to spend a fuel card and this fuel card will keep you from having to roll that exposure die so then you know that you're gonna be safe. But there are just gonna be some times in the game where you do not have that fuel card and you realize I have got to get from here to here for us to have a chance to win. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that chance because it's a 12 sided die. There's only one bite symbol on it. The chance of it even coming up is like 8.3%. It's not gonna happen. I'm gonna roll the die, I'm gonna throw it out there. There it is, it's the bite symbol. I lose, the character's dead, game is over. Come on, John Gilmore and Isaac Vega, why did you have to make Dead of Winter so hard? When dice are involved, you never really have a 100% chance of success. I just like games where it allows me to change the odds more towards my favor. That adds a whole new strategy to the game of trying to get additional dice, modifiers, and re-rolls before I have to rely on Lady Luck to smile upon me. But that is the tension that dice can add to a game, which is also very exciting because at some point in time, you're gonna to have to pick up a fistful of dice and you're gonna to have to roll them around in your hand. You've done everything that you can do. You've calculated your odds and you just gotta let it go and see what happens. I've only mentioned a few, but there are a lot of dice mitigation mechanics in board games. What are some of your favorites? Let me know in the comments. Why do you hate me so much? 
This is Ambie from Board Game Blitz, and this is Strategically Thematic, a segment where I talk about theme in different strategic games. This time, I'm talking about 18xx games, specifically 1830. Eighteen XX games are a family of economic train games with shared ownership in railroad corporations. Each player is a railroad tycoon, trying to amass the most wealth by investing in the different corporations. There are a bunch of different 18xx titles, each based on a different region and with slightly different mechanics to match the history and feel of railroad development in that area. 1830, which takes place in the eastern United States, is one of the most well-known 18xx games, since it was one of the first ones published. In 1830, you can start up railroad corporations by investing in shares of their stock, and you operate the corporations by building train track and running trains through the cities. Everyone starts out the game with a small amount of money and invests it in different railroad corporations. Throughout the game, which simulates decades in history, you'll be building up routes for your corporations to run through and getting revenue by having trains run through high-valued cities. As your company pays out dividends, its stock price increases, so your value can keep increasing throughout the game. But you can also sell shares of corporations, and that causes the stock to go down. Some may think that this isn't a very thematic stock market, but in the 19th century, the railroad tycoons actually had a lot of power over the stock market, and they engaged in a lot of stock manipulations. This can happen a lot in 1830, when players buy and sell shares of other corporations just to devalue another player's shares and make sure their own corporations come out on top. As the game goes on, cities are modernized and become more valuable, but trains also become more expensive. In the later 19th century, a lot of railroad corporations went bankrupt, and this is also shown through games of 1830. As the game goes on, trains start becoming obsolete, since newer models have come out. If the corporation can't keep up and loses all its trains, it's forced to buy a new train for a lot of money. When the company doesn't have enough money, the president of that company is liable for the cost, so it's just as easy to lose everything you have as it is to make millions. Even though 1830 may not be the prettiest game to look at, the feel of the game is super exciting and tense as you're vying against all these other railroad tycoons to come out on top. And with just a few map and rule changes, other 18xx games can have a completely different feeling, matching the theme of that specific game. For example, 1841 takes place in northern Italy, and partway through the game there's the Second Italian War of Independence that changes the Austrian borders and influences where your train tracks can run through. These thematic differences in the game can drastically alter the gameplay, and every 18xx game I've played has been exciting and unique. Thanks for watching Strategically Thematic. What are your favorite 18xx games? Let me know in the comments. This is Roy Candy from Epic Gaming Night, and this is Roll With The Punches, where we talk about randomness in games and how it can make a game exciting, and also how to twist luck into your favor. Today we're going to be talking about a game with lots of narrative and exciting randomness, and that is Above and Below. In Above and Below, players are going to be doing all sorts of different things to try to gather points. Whether it's getting resources, getting different buildings that can give them points, or sending their guys down to explore to improve their reputation. And there's all sorts of different actions you can do, whether it's har harvesting resources, building buildings. But one of the great things I love about this game is the narrative. One of the actions you can take is to explore, and you have to send at least two explorers. So let's say you bought like this guy, and you're gonna send um, your explorer lady and your dude out to um, go exploring. So say we are here, and we roll a six on the die, and so we're gonna explore 121. This is the Above and Below Encounter book. You come upon a group of fish folk conversing around a small fire. As you approach, you see that there's a seriously injured fish folk child in the midst of them. Someone in your group is trained in medicine, and you wonder if you might be able to help the child. Do you offer your help, or do you leave the fish folk to their own? So you have two different choices here. You can continue exploring, and then you'll need to explore, or you can help the fish folk, and you can 
either do four explore or seven explore and you get a plus two bonus lanterns to that if you have a potion. So it's interesting how there's all sorts of different stories in this book and you get random stories, but you can help mitigate that if you have certain items or if you have certain characters that can get you lots of lanterns. After the story is read for exploration, you try to see how many lanterns your characters can get. So with this character, we'll be rolling a die and trying, if we get a one or higher, we'll get one lantern. If we get a three or higher, we'll get two lanterns. Um, so with a four, that would give us two lanterns towards our goal. And then with this one, if we get a one or higher, which is all the time, we get one lantern. Or if we get a four higher, we'd get three whole lanterns. So we'd roll the die again and we got five. So in total, we'd have five lanterns all together. And for the story we read, if we had a potion, we would also be able to get an extra two lanterns, getting us to that seven cost, which could get us all sorts of extra resources. One of the interesting things is to mitigate that luck, there's several different buildings you can get that allow you to re-roll while doing these different explorations. So there's a bunch of awesome ways to mitigate it, and it also makes the theme exciting. You can find all sorts of resources or maybe some gold while you're down there to help you buy extra buildings and improve your village. And you can also find special villagers that you can add in. And it just makes the game exciting when you get these cool characters because of specific story that you you completed. Above and Below has all sorts of Euroly mechanics with trying to collect the right resources and get points and collect the right buildings so you can get more points. But my favorite part of the game is when you go below and do the story with exploring. It's a lot of fun and you can also mitigate that a lot by making sure you take a lot of people with a lot of lanterns and try to make the right choices that'll get you the most bang for the amount of lanterns you have. But then you're still rolling the dice and trying to get lucky. There's a lot of like buildings and things like that that can allow you to re-roll dice during those different actions so you can definitely set yourself up for success but then you're never really sure what you're gonna get I love the narrative and the tenseness of like all the different things and not knowing exactly what your choices outcome is gonna be but it's also cool because you can get extra resources that go into your your board and help you get extra points so I love how this is a euro -y game with tons of narrative and lots of story and it's got lots of randomness that make the game exciting well this has been roll with the punches thanks so much for checking out throw punch lunch and I'll see you on the next one. Hey guys, we need to talk about your flair. On 15 Pieces of Flair, I'm going to be showing you guys some ways to spruce up your game room. Something I love having in my game room is family pictures. And today I'm going to show you guys how to make this. Let's check it out. The tools and materials we're going to use today are going to be a piece of plywood approximately 24 inches long and at least 6 inches wide, a 6 inch tall maple stencil and a 5 inch tall maple stencil and a marker, a jigsaw with wood blade, don't forget the safety glasses, a power drill with a 1 inch drill bit and a screwdriver bit, sandpaper, various colors of paint, family photos and scissors, a staple gun, 6 screws for holding the meeples together, and a mounting bracket and screws. First, we're going to draw the stencils onto the wood. Then after we put our safety glasses on, we're going to carefully cut out each meeple. Then we'll drill a one inch hole into the head of each meeple for the picture to show through. We'll go through and sand down each one to smooth out all the edges, then wipe each one down with a damp rag. We'll then paint each one a different color. While those are drying, we'll cut out the faces on each picture. Later, we'll go through and trim up our pictures to fit better. Then we'll go through and staple each picture to the back of each meeple. Then we'll screw each meeple together from the back and be sure your screws aren't too long to poke through to the other side. And finally, we'll attach the mounting bracket. Hello, oh, there we have it. A quick and easy way to add some flair to your game room. Hey, if you guys have any games or ideas that you'd like me to make into some flair, just shoot me a message on Twitter at half handicap or leave them in the comment section below. And don't forget, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more, and we encourage that. Well, like John Paul, for example, he's got 37 pieces of flair and a terrific smile. That's what the flair's all about, guys. It's about fun. Have fun, guys. 
Hi, I'm Luke Hector. You might remember me from such productions as The Broken Meeple and Dice Tower Network. Here today at the Aircon 4 in 2017 March. We're here at this wonderful location checking out all the board games and fun. Sadly, Breacher 18 could not be here to... Oh, hey, Breach. What's going on? Uh, well, you weren't around. You were with the kids. I thought I'd help out. Well, this is, this is my segment for Throat Punch Lunch. This is so... Well, you know, Sam and I were talking, and, you know, you were off with the kids. I thought I'd help out. Sam would never do that to me. But Sam and I were like that. <laughs> just, just, come on, go. <laughs> Hi, guys, Breach 18, and I'm here at Aircom 4, and we are going to do another cafe chat segment, Con Edition. We may not use green, we may, we, okay. we're not sure yet, but this is a prototype. Uh, and currently, I'm doing demos of the game using words from the original game. Right, so okay. So if, if you notice that all these words are familiar, because I know you've memorised them all. Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously. That is true. Now, when we actually release the game, we're going to do a whole set of new words. Right, okay. I think we're going to move maybe 100 over from the base game. Okay. But we're going to do loads of extra words in there. So the way that it works is that anybody can go first and give us a clue just like normal code names. Yep. So I've got a clue of Armadillo 3. As soon as you give a clue, you pick up this stack of tiles. Okay. Okay. And then the other team will guess, and let's say they guess that one, because armadillos wear crowns, and they like carrots, and they live in New York, for example. Right? These go on there. Right. So every time you give a clue, you pick up the next stack, and then right. when you finish, you put them on there. Yep. If this runs out, you lose the game. Okay. The way you win the game is by getting rid of everything that's currently in your hand. Okay. So you don't need to get them all, you just need to get rid of everything that's in your hand. Sure. The way the game plays, the first time I played it, I was like, oh, this is clever, because you can start to work out what the three are that are the same because of the clues that the that other... You're giving He's given a clue, yeah. like kitchen, and I'm, I'm like, oh, well, hang on a minute, knife's one of ours. Yeah. So it must be one of theirs as well. Yeah. So and once you've you got that. the three duplicates, you then start to use that information mm -hmm. to your advantage. So as I say, it is, it is a great two-player game, but you can actually play. I played it yesterday with six people, with three on each side. Um, I've not gone into all the details of how the bystanders work, but that's pretty much how it plays. Cool. That, it does look really good, and the thing is, is I love code names, mm -hmm. but it's not very often I get a big group of gamers together. Right. So the fact that you can play this as a two-player yeah. game, and it's fully cooperative, yep. is really appealing, yep. especially to someone like me who plays a lot of two-player games. There you go. So, yep. excellent. And any kind of rough date when... We, we have to be in the past two years, we've all released, we'll always released the Codenames game at Gen Con. Hi, I'm Barney Baker from the CCG and Board Game Social. Uh, we're here at Aircon. The favourite game I've played is Snowblind. Um, came out at uh, Essen last year. It's a game where you're trying to get your team of explorers to the North Pole and back in one piece. Uh, you've been watching Cafe Chat. I'm Steve. I'm John. And I'm Andy. And we're Polyhedron Collider. You can find us at polyhedroncollider.com. And you can uh, listen to our podcast, uh, the Polyhedron Collider cast, on our website. Uh, my moment of calm so far, I've been playing the City of Kings, which is a brand new game that's been kicked out this month. My moment is just the whole thing, actually. I mean, the opportunity to sit down for two and a half days and just play games relentlessly, it's brilliant. And I have to say, I am really quite enjoying the Geek and some Table right here. We're uh, playing uh, Viticulture, and uh, I'm dangerously close to wanting to buy one of these things. Not that you're plugging for a freebie, right? No, no, no not at all. <laughs> no, no, we don't do free for that. I need to watch some Cafe Chat. Hi, I'm George, and I've just been playing um, Big Ticket to Ride at Aircon, and, and my favourite bit about Aircon is that I like to play family games with my family that I've not played yet, like Quirkle Cubes and Welcome to the Dungeon, and I just thought that was a nice time with my 
family. You've been watching Cafe Chat. Hello, I'm Mike B from the Who Dares Rolls podcast and website. I'm here at Aircon. Isn't it lovely? Full of air and con. Um, and my favourite thing about this has been loads and loads and loads of games to play, which is what we all come to these things to do. Um, and I've done lots of it. Unfortunately with Luke, but you know, you can't have it all. Um, and of course, buying stuff, because I like to buy stuff. So that's been my aircon experience. Uh, and it's been lovely, and I'm over and out. And this has been Cafe Chat. Hey, hey, welcome to Throw Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this is We'll Learn As We Go, where I'm going to be telling you how I would teach a particular game. This week, we're going to be talking about Dice Masters. Let's get down to the table. Yeah! Just joking. I wouldn't throw dice at you. It's fine. Two quick tips before I talk about playing the game. The first is related to these player mats here. This player mat does not come with the game. I bought it separate. However, it does end up being good reference, especially this section here. But the section that I'm pointing out does come in the rule book and you can print online versions of it, so I would suggest that you do that. Another tip is this is a pretty customizable game. So even though I talk about having all eight characters at the same time, it's not necessary. And if your collection's not big enough to account for that, it's completely fine to just say, hey, let's just play with four characters. Hey, instead of going to the full 20 life, let's just go to 15 or 10. Or hey, instead of playing with 20 dice, let's just play with 15 or 10 dice each. The first thing I want to do when I teach a game is talk about how to win the game. So in this game, you win from knocking your opponent's life down from a 20 to a KO, right? If you have this player mat here, there's a life track on the player mat itself. You can use whatever marker you have available. I'm going to be using this thing. When you talk about the life, though, when you talk about the goal of the game, it's at this opportunity that you want to distinguish between the player's life from the character's life within the game. You want to remind them that the characters in the game can hit you sitting at the table, and that's what their goal is. Sometimes when players haven't played too many one versus one Magic the Gathering style games, that concept is kind of foreign to them and it's hard for them to remember. After you talk about the goal of the game, quickly cover the different things on the anatomy of the card. Point out the price of the card, what energy type you have to use to buy the card, any abilities that they have, and don't necessarily go into these in too much detail. Just tell the players that that's where the abilities of the cards are written. And then point out that this is the dice faces that that character has. Whatever character card you choose to use, bring out the dice for that character as well. Use the dice itself to talk about the fact that their energy on the dice and what the different numbers on the character die represent. And also cover that there are different levels of the character die as well. At this point, because you've talked about the anatomy, the card, and the dice already, go ahead and give the player that you're playing with your character cards. Let them pick eight of their own favorite characters and what cards that they want to use. They'll have some idea of what to look for. And part of the fun is being able to say, hey, I want to play with Iceman because he is cool. So let them pick whatever characters they want. And while they're doing that, you can go ahead and look through the action cards. And I suggest that you, the teacher, pick the action cards that you want to use for that game. This is a game that I teach based on turn structure. So the first phase of the turn is the dice bag phase. At this point, you want to talk about the main mechanic of the game. Explain drawing four dice out of the dice bag and rolling whatever dice are in your prep area. It, they don't have to understand how dice end up in the prep area at this point. Just let them understand that at the beginning of their turn, they draw four dice plus whatever dice are in their prep area, and they're able to roll those dice. If they don't have four dice in their dice bag, let them know to pull out whatever dice they can, empty the used pile into their dice bag, and then draw however many more dice they need to draw. When you hit the reserve pool, that's when you want to talk about rolling and re-rolling dice as well as buying dice. So there's a lot to talk about when you're talking about the reserve pool, so go ahead and take it slow. Talk about how that's the time when you roll the dice 
and you could have one reroll phase. So maybe I'll take these and I'll reroll those. At this point, show them the different energy faces on the die and let them know what they mean. For example, on the sidekick die, show them the different types of energy that show up, including the fist, the mask, the bolt, the shield, and the wild card, as well as the neutral energy that show up on the action die. In short, to buy a character die, you need to pay the cost printed at the top of the card, but at least one energy die has to match the energy face on the card. And you can't use a neutral die to substitute for that energy type that you need. At this point, you've talked about buying cards as well as the rolling and re-rolling. And you can briefly talk about how the action cards work, including their abilities, the fact that it's triggered by getting an exclamation point. At this point, if any of the cards have a global ability, explain how the global abilities work as well. And when you buy a character, let them know that you move that character die to their used pile. After that, you want to talk about the field zone. And there's a couple things you want to make sure you mention about the field zone. One, you want to make sure that you mention that to field a character, sometimes a character has a fielding cost. And sometimes you want characters to remain in the field even though they have the opportunity to attack because once they attack, they might be out of that round. After you talk about the field zone, you could talk about how to attack and how blocking works. When you covered the anatomy of the die, you should have covered what the different numbers on the die represent. Just really quickly, this is the fielding cost, this is the attack, and this is the defense. Let them know that combat works simultaneously. So in this situation, Iceman and Magneto would attack simultaneously. Iceman's three attack would go up against Magneto's seven defense, and Magneto's five attack would go up against Iceman's six defense. Hey, hey, thanks for joining me on this week's We'll Learn As We Go on Throw Punch Lunch, where I talked about how I would teach Dice Masters. I'm gonna go play some Dice Masters now. I'm pretty excited. Come on, Colossus. Let's go play. Bye.
Battle of Punchies, I'm Forrest from Bowers Game Corner. I'm back again for three reasons where I do something vaguely related to the number three. And today, quarter one of 2017 is just about over. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And I'm going to be going over my three favorite games that I've gotten a chance to try from quarter one of 2017. One of them's a big one, but the other two are definitely off the beaten path. First and foremost, we have Coliseum from Tasty Minstrel Games. A lot of people were excited about this game. The uh, little asterisk, this is my first time ever trying out Coliseum was with this version of the game, and I see what all the hubbub is about. Really enjoyed this one. I love the new art style, but that's a your mileage may vary kind of thing. But I put it like this in my review. The game doesn't do any one particular thing excellently, but it does everything it does in this game. You're doing a lot of different phases that are very distinct. It does all of them very well, and it comes together to make a really great game. Coliseum, Tasty Minstrel Games, Really excited to see this one back in print. Highly recommend this one. Next, I have Dozen Donuts from Monocle Society. Now, this one completely caught me off guard. This one was on Kickstarter. They sent me a copy to review. I played it with my family, and this is a matching game. It is a very simple matching game, but it adds special abilities. It has a couple little quirks here and there that change up the game, and they make it what a matching game should be. My family loves this game. My son adores this game. Uh, I brought it into my classroom. The younger children really like this one. That is Dozen Donuts from Monocle Society, one I can highly recommend if you have young children. Last but not least, I have World Championship Russian Roulette from Tuesday Night Games. The guys who brought you two rooms in a broom bring you this. This is a game where you're going to be taking control of a team of your color at the World Championship Russian Roulette. And in essence, this is a light filler game, a bluffing game, a player elimination game, and an excellent game. Don't let the theme scare you off. This game is so good. Easy to learn, easy to teach, great components, interesting action cards, really cool metagame. It's one of those games that gets better the more you play it, kind of like Coup or Sheriff of Nottingham. Highly recommend this one. I think you're going to hear a lot about this game in the next coming months. That is World Championship Russian Roulette. Probably my early favorite game of 2017 right here. But those were my three favorite games of quarter one 2017. What is your favorite game that has came out so far this year? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, back to more Throat Punch of Goodness. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson with Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash, a mere thrash gaming for those of us who like to play alone. This week we're going to be discussing a small box dungeon crawler called One Deck Dungeon. One Deck Dungeon is a small footprint game that's designed for either one player or for a two-person co-op experience. If you buy two sets of the game, you can actually play it up to four people. As with any RPG, you'll first choose your character, so you can be a rogue, an archer, a paladin, a warrior, or a mage, and you will have different starting stats and abilities based on the role that you chose. So you will have special abilities at the bottom of your character card that are unique to your character, and you will also know which dice that you're supposed to roll for encounters in the dungeon based on your character stats up here. So a rogue, for example, will have one yellow strength die, four pink agility dice, and two of these blue magic dice. For each game of One Deck Dungeon, you will choose the dungeon that you want to progress through, and it will actually get harder as you descend to lower floors of the dungeon until you're finally ready to face the boss. The way that you pass time, gain experience, and have encounters in the game is all found here in the Invent Deck. So for each turn, you discard cards just to have your turn. Then you can choose to explore and lay cards out, but that would actually count as an entire turn. Then for your next turn, you would have to discard cards again for the right to choose a room to explore. So let's say I just wanted to explore this one. Then you would actually face your encounter. So in this case, we have a boulder. So you'd either need to roll 11, um, 11 dice using your blue magic dice and lose some time, or you could try to run past it, which would require 14 agility. As a rogue, maybe I could do it. Um, but, of course, if you fail, you'll have to take the consequences that are listed on the card. And the same thing goes for facing enemies. Um, if I decided that I was not up to this challenge, I would actually be able to choose to flee from it instead, but it would waste a turn, and then I'd have to spend more time, which means more cards from the deck, 
to basically purchase the ability to open another room that might be more favorable for me. The goal of the game is ultimately to progress through all of the floors of the dungeon, which means going through the event deck three times, and then facing the boss at the end. And throughout your time in the dungeon, you will hopefully defeat some encounters and gain the bonuses that come with them. So for example, if I did defeat the boulder, I'd have the option, if I, I would have the option of either taking four experience, adding a strength die to my, um, to my dice pool, plus an extra heart, or I could take this extra skill at the bottom. So you actually get choices when it comes to encounters you defeat as to what benefits you're going to reap from them. Ideally, throughout the game, you're going to level up, which enables you to carry more items and acquire more skills. And of course, the higher level you are, the more ability you have to face the boss at the end. Um, of course, this is a roguelike. And what that means is that you could just get a bunch of encounters that you're not ready for right at the beginning of the game and die. It happens a lot, but it's still a really fun game. And every time you play, you're going to learn a little bit about the strategies that you can use to live a little bit longer, get a little bit further until you're satisfied. The thing that's very interesting about One Deck Dungeon is that if you want to take your character's experience and gain skills further than just one game, you actually can, because this game has a campaign mode that you can track on this separate notepad. So I actually think that's a really interesting addition to the game. Um, it motivates me to do a little bit more long-term planning and to treat my games with more care, because I know that if I wanted to, I could continue and actually do an entire campaign with the character that I'm developing. I will admit that when I first picked up One Deck Dungeon, I did it to fill out a cool stuff order and I didn't know whether I was going to like it or not. Um, sometimes dice games don't sit very well with me because I really suck at rolling dice. But I actually really enjoyed this one. Um, I love that there are ways to add dice to your dice pool and to mitigate a bad roll. So it makes it a lot easier to deal with the fact that I'm a terrible dice roller. Um, and I also just really enjoyed the act of progressing through the different floors of the dungeon trying to get to the boss. It is a roguelike, so you will die a lot, but it was fun. And I love that there is even a campaign mode, so I can take my character's skills and power-ups beyond one single game. Um, overall, I really enjoyed this one, and I hope that you will too. So happy gaming. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette, the Metal Meeple, and this is the Miniature Breakdown. So on this episode, we're gonna take a look at Alchemy. This is a miniature level, or a skirmish level miniature hobby game. And essentially you're gonna play one-on-one. -on -one. You're gonna build a team, most like a lot of these hobby miniature games. But I'm gonna go over some of the unique aspects of this game that I thought set it apart. The first thing is you do play on a four foot by four foot table, but each team are gonna have these alchemists. And these alchemists need alchemical elements in order to cast their spells, which are these tokens and things. and uh, you just mark the scenery elements that you put in play, you know, such as a pond or a river or whatever, with these tokens, and that's what type of mana they're going to draw out of them. And you mark them on their card, and they spin those to actually cast their, their different spells and such. So I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Let me go over one of the cards here that's not sleeved, so you can easily see it. Basically, you're going to have 300 points worth of guys. Sometimes you have multiple guys on a card. These are their health bars. And this will determine one of th one big thing, and that's what type of dice you're going to roll. You got these red, white, and yellow. Uh, white being the best, red being the worst. So as your character takes damage, they're going to start deteriorating on their dice rolls. You've got four major stats of the four elements. That's a number that you're going to add to two dice that you roll of whatever color uh, your health is at at that time. And you have to equal or exceed certain uh, stats and things like that. Uh, for the most part, this top number is what you roll your dice plus that number to see who goes first on the round uh, initiative. This number is who goes first in close combat because every time you fight, both players are going to go. And then this number you're going to roll and add it together to see if you def uh, equal or exceed their defense. You got some other numbers on here. You can walk, which is like four. Uh, this character can be four inches. You can run, which is 10 inches, or you can charge, which is six. Uh, charge is the only way you can get into close combat, and you have to use action points, which is this black number in the middle, in order to do all this, all these actions. Running costs two, most things cost one. Combat's pretty simple. You basically, or combat's pretty unique, sorry. You have these cards here, and it's kind of a paper rock, um, a paper rock scissors system. You have a normal attack, a quick attack, and a brutal attack, and both players are going to select when you get into close combat, which card you want to fight with. There's two others that we'll go over in a minute as well. Uh, basically, if you choose normal and the other person chooses quick, then this person gets a one die bonus against normal 
anytime you get a bonus or a penalty, you roll an extra dice and you either take the two highest or two lowest, depending on if it's a bonus or a penalty. And then, but since it's a quick attack, you don't do much damage, and so your damage is, is lowered one column, uh, whereas in the brutal, it's raised one column. You can also choose parry, in which case if you like triple their roll, you get to actually make an attack against them, and then you can choose not to do anything because you still need action points to do these things. So as you move around on your turn, you activate, uh, each player is going to choose a card essentially to activate and then move all the guys on that card, spend all their action points. So if they got action points left, then they can retaliate when they actually get into combat and such. And da damage is pretty simple. As you roll these dice, you know, say I've got, well, I rolled really terrible on that, but say you roll these two yellows, you got six plus your combat stat, which is seven, eight, you have to equal or exceed their defense. Let's say you did, then you take those symbols, that's two swords, and you match it up on this damage grid here, and that's how many damage you do in close combat and range. So you're only gonna do usually one to four damage or so, and you don't have that many hit points anyway. Range combat is a little bit unique. You have to guess the distance to your attacker. If you're too uh, short, you're gonna miss. If you're too far, you're gonna hit. But if you get it right on the dot, or at least on their base, you actually get an aiming bonus and you get another die. So pretty cool system, pretty cool uh, thing. Uh, it's not around anymore, but it's easily picked up. So if you got any questions, feel free to email me at timjanet at metal meeple or at gmail.com and uh, follow me on the Instagram and things like that below. So till next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Hey everyone, it's Mark Zolinski and welcome to Counter Charge. Today we're going to talk about a crossover product. As many people know, I love Super Dungeon Explorer by Soda Pop Miniatures. It's a great game. It's got two, really two games in the box. It's got arcade mode and then it's got more of an RPG style board game in it. And right now they're finishing up the rules for Super Dungeon Explorer Legends that's going to bring a role playing element to it where you can use the chibi miniatures. Fantastic. So what can they do to top that? Well, they went ahead and put out this little product right here. This is an Iron Golem for the Super Dungeon Explorer board game. But one of the things that this little baby comes with is a Steam key that you can go over to Steam and download Super Dungeon Tactics, which is very, very cool. So first we're going to go to the closed camp, check out my buddy here in the Iron Golem, and then we're going to go check out Super Dungeon Tactics on Steam. All right, here's our buddy, the Iron Golem. This is one beefy miniature. He is fantastic. And of course, he acts as a mini boss in your regular games of Super Dungeon Explorer. So we have his arcade mode card. And then we also have his regular Super Dungeon Explorer card there. And he also comes with a special treasure card, Von Holtz Sword. Now, the most important thing that he comes with, actually, is this Steam key right here for unlocking Super Dungeon Tactics. So let's go check that out right now. All right, welcome to Super Dungeon Explorer here on Steam. So this is the opening screen. My son Colin loves playing this game and he's gonna be doing the clicking here. So you're gonna go ahead and start your campaign, select your little profile and boom, in you go. Now, this is not Super Dungeon Explorer. It is a game based on Super Dungeon Explorer. All of the little miniatures and everything else like that, all the characters in here are miniatures in the game. Okay, and so it gives you that real Super Dungeon Explorer feel. Actually, there's some mechanics here in the uh, game that I would really like to see in the board game, uh, such as the initiative system. So, here is the dwarf. He is getting ready to go on his quest. So. We're going to go ahead and let Colin get his party together, and we'll be right back. All right, Colin's got his adventuring party ready to go, so we're going to go ahead and hit the ready button, and we're going to go out into the world. As you can see, this scenario is called Bump in the Night. So we go ahead and get a little flavor text here, and you go ahead and get your mission and stuff like that before you get out into the world. Okay, here we go. We're inside the main engine of Super Dungeon Tactics on what you're going to see. As you can see, when you click on a character, it highlights where you can move. All right, and uh, we're just about to fight somebody. So 
you go ahead and click on them there and you do the attack pretty cool so a little bit of battling there all right Now, in this particular scenario, they're trying to get to the questing knight so that he can join the party. As you can see, the computer runs the various characters that you are fighting. And so, that is a quick rundown on Super Dungeon Tactics. I know it was real quick. Again, three, four minutes here in these segments, we can't cover everything. But I encourage you to check it out, especially if you like Super Dungeon Explorer because it's really cool. So, and until next time, take care. Hello and welcome back to Jedi Mind Games. My name's Kodai, and today we're gonna to be wrapping up our coverage and overview of Jabba's Realm. So, we only have the Rebel Faction left, and they didn't get much, they got the Alliance Ranger, and they got Luke Skywalker Jedi Knight. So let's take a look at the Alliance Ranger. So I'm going to be going over the Elite version, although I do think the non-Elite version of the Ranger is very good. The You get less health, and you get less ability on Sniper. But let's take a look at the Elite version. It comes in at 12 cost, which is a lot of points, so they better do a lot. Let's take a look. They have 7 health, which is really good. That's that's a good amount of health for 3 figures each. They roll double blue. Double blue is good. That helps them get the range. And they have a, an ability called Elite Sniper. While attacking, if the target space is 5 or more spaces away, you may re-roll up to 2 attack dice. This is great for hitting those long range shots, and you're going to be counting the spots on the board going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, sometimes 10, and go... You know, yeah, I can hit that. I can hit that guy. It's going to blow your mind sometimes how far away you can shoot with these with these characters. And if you give them a focus, so that's a green die, they're going to be doing some good amount of damage. And if you get some nice surges with it, they have a pierce one, and they have a plus two for damage. So I really think these units are really nice for the rebels. I... I fully support this. They have a great trait. They have Trooper and Hunter. So you can run them with your Trooper spam if you wanted, or you know you can have some Hunter's cards in the command deck as well. I think this is going to be a really great unit, and I can't wait to see what lists are coming out of this guy. Moving along, we're going to talk about Luke Skywalker, Jedi Knight. So let's take a look at his card, and it, he's also 12 cost, and let's see what he does for just a single character. So he has an automatic one damage and an automatic surge cancel. That's pretty good so far. And then he has a surge for plus one damage and he has a surge for pierce three. That pierce three is pretty big. I like that. I like that surge a lot. So the his abilities on his card say deflect after a ranged targeting you or an adjacent friendly figure resolves. A hostile figure of your choice in your line of sight suffers one damage. So what I really think Java's Realm is trying to do is mitigate some of the trooper spam and add in some cards that help you mitigate that. So in my opinion, Luke Skywalker does help that a lot because, you know, if you have him next to one of your friendly figures, he can deflect with his lightsaber and it shoots right back at that stormtrooper. So they may or may not want to shoot at that friendly figure of yours if, Jedi, uh, if Luke Skywalker is next to them. They might think twice about that. And then the main the main striking ability on the card is certainly heroic. Once during your activation, you may perform an attack without spending an action. This is crazy. <laughs> I initially looked at his attack dice. It's blue, green, and yellow, which is nothing to write home about. But when you have a free attack, you're gonna that's a that's great. I have no complaints about Luke Skywalker Jedi Knight. This is a fantastic figure. And you have three, uh, three header, three header abilities. You have force user, leader, and brawler. So you can mix in some great command cards with that. And you have Son of Skywalker, which came in the core box. Son of Skywalker allows him to activate again, so you can go on a rampage. So 
if you just run, if you run Luke in, you attack twice, and then they take their turn, comes back to you, Son of Skywalker, you are going to wreck their face. <laughs> it, is just, it is going to be a mess. He's going to just come in and wreck people. So that wraps it up for Jabba's Realm for Imperial Assault. If you guys have any comments or questions, please be sure to put them below, and I'll be sure to answer them. If you want to find out more about Board Game Essentials, go to youtube.com slash boardgameessentials. And with that, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your lunch. All right, take care. So as you can see, my contributors are continuing to knock it out of the park. At least I think so. Yes, I know I'm biased, but you should be too because uh, this is a great show. Uh, I just can't get over it. I love every single segment that gets put out, even though sometimes the games aren't exactly what I'm looking for. I know that it's probably speaking to some of you out there and it's giving you a better look at a game that normally I wouldn't cover or somebody else on the Dice Tower wouldn't cover. So that's the cool thing about Throw Punch Lunch. We're covering a bunch of different games from a bunch of different angles and I really enjoy it. I hope you do too. Well, that's it for this week. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. See you on the flip side. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.